when you move your neck laterally. And if you find a spot, then what you'll do, the position of comfort, would be to passively shorten, loosen that scalene, which is this position, and you will wait for the position of comfort to uh, help that not relax, and then you will come back to neutral, then you will move to that length of the position. Again, we'll tap, ask for 20% effort on this tense and relax. Relax. This one we can go easily the opposite direction, which gives us that reciprocal inhibition. Relax, thank you. We can then come back to neutral, reassess. And that's the isolation for the scalenes. The next isolation will be for the upper fibers of the trapezius muscle. The trapezius muscle is a large covering muscle. Starts clear at the uh, base of the occiput, continues all the way down to the 12th vertebra in the thoracic vertebra, and then comes up and comes out just midway of the scapula and up. So it's a large covering muscle. That uh, broad origin then is called a aponeurosis, it's a broad flat tendon. And these covering muscles tend to be more postural in addition to the movement they do some a lot of the stabilization. So this covering muscle was actually over top of the levator scapula and the scalenes. So when we're doing the fibers of the trapezius, the upper fibers, if we look at where the muscle uh, inserts, then we can see that in that straight line pull. Now we talked about, well actually we haven't, but muscles are quite simple. They pull in straight lines. So a muscle like the trapezius can be kind of confusing because it has so many directions. But you have to keep in mind that muscles always pull in a straight line. So if there's a difference in the direction, it's because the fibers then have a different origin. But going to that insertion will simplify this because this broad origin, this aponeurosis, will then converge on the insertion, helps us visualize that in a more simple way. So, starting here at the insertion, let's look at the three major directions. One is direct, sorry, obliquely superior to the occiput. You have other fibers that come across directly medial to those vertebra and then you have fibers that travel down in an oblique manner to the lower thor thoracic vertebra. So for the isolation for the upper fibers then the shoulder would then be moved up okay because as those fibers contract in a straight line they will raise the shoulder. If we wanted to isolate these fibers then that contraction would be directly retracting the shoulders. And if we were going to isolate these fibers, then the shoulders would be pulled down, okay? So by going to that insertion, it can help simplify what looks like a very complex muscle. So for these upper fibers, we would warm, as we always do, if you find a trigger point that would not be unusual to find one in the traps, then we would find a position of comfort, which is passively slacken the muscle, then reestablish our neutral, and add any stretch that we can, and then with a 20% effort, raise that shoulder up. There you go. Do a tense and relax. And we can and press back this way. Also access the upper fibers that way. And relax. And that's the isolation for the upper fibers of the trapezius. The next isolation in your packet is for the posterior aspect of the sternocleidomastoid. However, it's much easier to access in a supine position, so we're going to skip to the next muscles, which are splenous services and splenius capitis muscles. Okay, 
The origins of the splenius cavitus and splenius services are along the thoracic vertebra, okay? And they continue up. The services come to the transverse processes again in the uh, cervical vertebra. The capitis, and they kind of weave themselves together. Capitis comes all the way to the occiput, okay? So as you warm and look for those triggers, then we will then lengthen after we have done our position of comfort. And you can add a little bit of twist there because they're, they kind of help turn the head a little bit. And this is similar to the levator scapula isolation. Notice that Joe is up on his elbows again. You may even want to combine these when you do your work. Okay, so position of comfort is here. And we then move to our lengthened position. And here we can do a four-way tense and relax. And again, 20% effort. And give that tense and relax a little bit of time, five to eight seconds, even more, because it warms the muscle and it just creates greater awareness, which is what we're trying to do with our resetting of the proprioception. We are now going to combine the isolations for the rotator cuff group and the rhomboids because they are so similar in movement. The rotator cuff group uh, are deep muscles and they stabilize this joint at the shoulder. Okay, Supraspinatus is something that comes down and when it contracts it raises the shoulder a little bit. Okay, The infraspinatus comes across and it retracts the shoulder. And of course, this is familiar to what the trapezius does. Teres minor will depress the shoulder, as will the subscapularis, will also help depress the shoulder, okay? So, we need to go in four different directions, just as we did with some of the other muscles. The rhomboids also will use these same four directions for their isolation. So that's why we're combining these two. So when you are working with the supraspinatus, then your position of comfort would be this position. When you work with the supraspinatus, your position of comfort then would be to shrug the shoulder up or to raise the shoulder. The infraspinatus then would be to lift the shoulder this way that also is the, uh, the isolation for the rhomboids. For the teres minor, this would be the position of comfort. And for the subscapularis, this will help a little bit. We'll talk more about that uh, on the supine side, okay? So those are the positions of comfort. And then when you do your PNF, your resetting of the proprioception, you can ask your client to press up with the arm. Press up, please. No, this direction, there you go. That gets the supraspinatus, okay? And relax, and press up this way, please. See how the rhomboids and the infraspinatus flex, okay? And press down, see how, again, that retracts the shoulder blade, that is teres minor and subscapularis, and then hug into the, yes. And that also will help flex that subscapularis and relax. And that's how we would combine the, the sequence there for both the rotator cuff group and the rhomboids. The isolations for the deltoid, you will see also, are going to mirror some that we have already done. The deltoid has three groups of fibers. There's the anterior, the medial, and the posterior and they're going to move in three different directions. Those directions are similar to what we've already done. The anterior, when we <clears throat> uh, want to flex that, then they can hug in towards the table. You will feel that. Now for your position of comfort, you would have to bring the arm up a little bit and that could help find that position of comfort. Okay? For the <clears throat> 
medial fibers, then the arm will be raised up towards the top of the table. And that would be your position of comfort. Your, then your flex position would be down and as they give you some 20% of effort on the tensor relax, that would reset the proprioception in that lengthened position. And for the posterior fibers, you would simply bring the arm up and you can see how that's going to let that relax. And then in the lengthened position, they would flex back and that would reset the pro proprioception there. So you can see again how that mirrors some of the isolations we have already used, but that's because the muscles of course cooperate continuously and so that's actually going to make it a little simpler for you for some of these isolations. Okay, before we leave this shoulder area, we want to show you a strategy, a uh, position that will help with the rhomboid and the antagonist muscle to the rhomboid, the pectoralis minor, because rhomboids are an area in most people that you will find tender, knotted up areas. We don't want to forget that muscles always work as protagonist and antagonist. We mentioned reciprocal inhibition. Most people in their posture will have their shoulders pulled in a little bit. That's the pectoralis minor. It is in that constant shortened position, so it is constantly inhibiting the antagonist muscle, which is the rhomboid. Okay? So, if this muscle stays constantly tight, and roll shoulders will indicate that, then the rhomboid is constantly weakened or inhibited because that's the way the muscles communicate back and forth. Now, the pectoralis minor attaches at the coracoid process and that is part of the scapula. So that is how it is able to pull those shoulders forward. We want to reestablish a better posture, a straighter shoulder. Okay, now the coracoid process you'll see in your ACB or on Mr. Bones. But on yourself, to be able to palpate that, go to your shoulder, start working in with simple pressure, and you'll find a spot right about there that will be the attachment, and that's where the coracoid process, which means crow's beak, that actually extends and provides a place for the bicep muscle, the pectoralis muscle, and the coracobrachialis muscle to attach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what we call a winging position. Do this carefully because many times their shoulders are tight. And I'm going to bring my arm and cup that deltoid. And at that point, I'm going to palpate a little bit and see if I find a tender point in the same place we just palpated on ourselves. Joe, is that pretty tender? Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to kind of block, gently block the elbow with my body because oftentimes there's enough tension the arm will just fall right back off. Now you can see how the scapula itself has popped up a little bit. If, if a person is very, if their shoulder is very tight, then this will hardly show any movement and that's a sign of real, real need for work. Some folks are very flexible and it will really be pronounced. So we will then work to mobilize this entire area. We're able to mobilize the shoulder. We can do a nice pull laterally. And then we can additionally be working those insertion points for the rhomboids. Oftentimes when there's a numbness in the forearm, it can be coming from this area's several of these areas in the shoulder. So this is what is called winging and part of what's important about this is to get you to realize that when a muscle is constantly knotted up full of trigger points don't overlook the antagonist muscle because they work back and forth and in the case of the rhomboid since it's inhibited and it is weakened it has to work extra hard and that extra work is what gives you some of the trigger point formation. Okay, so here we have that technique. You can practice that. Next, we will be working with a group called the paraspinals or erector spinae muscles. 
Now the paraspinals run entirely up the spine and <clears throat> they are covered of course by the rhomboids and the trapezius so we won't focus as much there since we've worked that area a little bit. But the paraspinals are those small deep muscles that run in between each of the vertebra. When you get down to the low back, then the erector spinae are a group that it's kind of a covering muscle and you have the spinalis, you have the longissimus, and then you have the iliocostalis that it's like a big tree that branches off into three, well, branches, okay? And then the paraspinals themselves are specific right to the vertebra, okay? So that is how those interact. Now, when we work the paraspinals, we'll often use our elbow. And when we find areas that are tender, okay, say, an area here, Joe, you kind of reacted there. Is that tender? Yeah, it's a little tender. Okay. Now, you will perhaps use brace fingers. You may need to use your knuckles, or you may need to use your elbow, depending on how much hand strength and experience you have. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to use braced fingers. I'm going to hold that spot, and our position of comfort is going to be one where we allow that area to slacken and relax okay and we bring that down and we have a position that Diane has coined the swimmer and that's where you raise your arms up just as if you were swimming and you can see how that will activate these muscles clear down to the bottom of the scapula because of course that's how the arm and shoulder moves when you get lower than that and you get down into the lumbar vertebra then you don't have as much movement here so you're going to add a little bit of twist to the body and diane has coined that the hyper swimmer so joe i want you to actually move your upper but there you go and we bend at the waist continue with the swimming kind of motion and there you have a movement that will activate these paraspinals okay and then what we can do is rotate that. Joe, I want you to now bring this arm back and do that same hyper swimmer move here. Good. And that will then allow us a position of comfort in the low back. So when we have a position of comfort on this side of the spine, you can see that we have the extended flex position on this side of the spine. So we can use that in an alternating way to help us with our INIT sequence. So Joe, what I want you to do is slowly move from this position on this side to the same position on the other side. In other words, the hyper swimmer to the other side. And as he moves, I can just feel this flex and you'll feel it too. And of course, now we're in the extended and come back again, please. And let's go one more time to the opposite side. And now, as we block this arm, I'll have him give me 20% of an effort back that'll reset this paraspinal in this newer, longer, resting position. And go back to the middle. Now, if we had a spot higher up in the thoracic vertebra rather than in the lumbar, we wouldn't need as much bend. We don't need the hyper swimmer necessarily. We'll just use the swimmer and we'll use that same alternating movement. Joe, would you then just do the swimmer from side to side, do it nice and slow, and you can feel the muscle flex and then relax. And what this does is it gives you your reset and your proprioception reset. Okay, and now for a little bit of resistance, give me 20% effort coming back. And that is how we do our PNF reset with our tensor relax isometric. Okay, thank you, Joe.
The final muscle group that we will be working with in today's session will be called the quadratus lumborum. This muscle has four attachments and is indicated in most low back pain, as is the iliopsoas, which we will be discussing in a later session. As you will observe on page 7 in the positional release INIT section of your class manual, this muscle attaches at the 12th rib and also rises up from the arch of the ilium and is often called the hip hiker muscle because when this muscle is tense and tight, this mu muscle will actually hike the hip. So the areas we work will be right at the 12th rib. That's one prime area for trigger points. Moving down and into the vertebra, the lumbar vertebra as a second point, and then down and a little bit lateral to the crest of the ilium. Okay, those three points. Should you find a trigger point, and you very often will, then your position of comfort is going to be to bring this leg up, bring the knee up, bring the shoulder down, forming the body into a C. In order for you to see this body position and change better, we have redraped Joe so that you can see when we move from the C position into the extended position. So Joe, if you would, bring this leg up into a C and bring the body down, okay? And that is the position of comfort. Then when we want to go into the extended position, now this leg comes down and crosses over. And hopefully you can see better now that position. And we go to the hyper swimmer as before. And again, we tap, we ask for 20% effort on our tense and relax. And that will give us the resetting of the proprioception. And this is how we lengthen that quadratus lumborum muscle. In today's class, we will demonstrate isolations for the gluteal region and the posterior leg. The gluteal muscles and the muscles of the low back work together at the waistline. Neither work in isolation. When there is pain or stiffness in either the low back or the glutes, you can be sure that because they balance each other, the other one will be affected. For example, when you find pain in the quadratus lumborum, you will most assuredly find related pain in the gluteus medius because the muscles of the low back and the glutes balance and anchor each other. In the same way that the low back and glutes are related, because they work together, the gluteal region and posterior leg muscles are similar in the way they work together. Okay, you'll notice that I'm working over clothes. Um, when I do glute work, because I like to be able to translate that into sports massage, uh, I could be working in a fun run or I could be working therapeutically, then I work typically over linen or over uh, clothes. Uh, that allows me to work on guys and they don't have to feel uncomfortable. It may be someone's first massage and I just don't go right to skin on skin at the glutes. That's one area that I do work over clothes. So, uh, the glutes, as was mentioned, they work in balance and in harmony with the low back, and in this case it would be erector spinae paraspinals and the gluteus maximus will balance, and if you were to the lateral side, the quadratus lumborum, the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, then would work as a team, so to speak. So if you were to find tender points or trigger points in the gluteus maximus, okay, that is the muscle that drives the leg. So that position of comfort then, Joe, would you just lift your knee and at that point your position of comfort again is going to be in the passive contracted range of, of motion and if you then would have them press the knee down into the table for the resetting or, and of course that is the opposing muscle, the psoas is the opposing muscle for the gluteus maximus. Or we could actually have them go slightly sideline, bring the leg up again. And as you see, that is going to stretch 
and put the gluteus maximus in that position. Now I would have him press down with 20% effort and that would reset the proprioception for the gluteus maximus, okay? If we were working then with the gluteus minimus and medius, they flex to the outside. You can see that flexion take place when I have Joe make that active motion and relax, okay? So with that, we would then move the leg to the outside. That is gonna move into a slackened position, position of comfort. And we would do the same thing, then bringing the leg across. And as we mentioned, the, the lumborum, this stretches the quadratus lumborum, but also stretches the gluteus minimus and, and medius. Okay. In addition to the superficial covering gluteus maximus and the medius and minimus, then you have six deep lateral rotators. And the, the maximus and those deep rotators all travel and insert on the greater trochanter uh, in one area or another on the trochanter. So they all have the ability to do a lateral rotation. They are deep to the gluteus maximus. So when we do work with the piriformis, or we find other areas that are tender along the border of the sacrum, that is the origin. The sacrum is the origin for the gluteus maximus and those deep lateral rotators. And the insertion is in the greater trochanter. Notice how the broad origin and the more focused insertion. So that means if you go to the greater trochanter, and you can find that simply by taking your fist and pushing in, Okay. If it were on this side, you could you can feel that. You can even feel that on your own leg. It's that great big hip bone. Okay, but that's the trochanter. Now from there, you can see that you have that fanning, uh, that orientation going back to the broader origin. So at the trochanter may be a place that you can kind of simplify your visualization. For instance, the piriformis, we know that that also attaches, originates at the sacrum and comes to the trochanter. So that gives you an idea of where you can feed back to the sacrum and find the pir piriformis that way. Okay. So the covering muscles, the deep rotators still have the same kinds of isolations. Okay. We talked about how for the gluteus maximus, <clears throat> we would lift up for the position of comfort. That would also have some impact on the deep rotators. The movement out is going to have, again, uh, an impact on the medius and minimus. And if you have an active client, and you may have someone like Joe, for instance, is a sizable young man, and you might find that if you can recruit your client to be involved a little bit, it's gonna save you a lot of uh, awkward positioning in some cases. And it also, by having them actively involved, you will have an active proprioception and a resetting. Um, and so you can combine those two in something we call INIT with movement. Now there are contraindications for that. If your client has chronic low back pain, then you're going to continue doing the passive kind of movements. You'll put them into the position that you want. But if they don't have that chronic pain, if they are quite active and fit, then I might do something where if I know there is some tenderness here, 